first church I pastored was Hilltop Baptist in Fort Worth, Texas. It was a small church, a lot like this one. They voted me in seven to zero, a unanimous call. In fact, it's the only unanimous call I ever received. It was located in a pretty tough neighborhood. The front door of that church was busted in so often that we finally started leaving it unlocked and we put a sign on it that said, open, come in. There wasn't anything of value in there except an organ and we wanted them to steal that. Well, there was a little parsonage just around the corner and the reason, the only reason I got the job as pastor was because no one else's wife would agree to live there. God used those wonderful people at Hilltop to teach me a lot, and I carry it to this day. The community around us was transitioning, and because our church members were willing to adjust, we were able to reach new people. We grew up from about seven to over 50 in that period of time. We had some committed prayer warriors. The impact of prayer is not limited by church size or church budget. I also learned that when you're part of a Southern Baptist family, any church of any size can have an impact far beyond its four walls and its community. You see, those members of Hilltop who gave faithfully to our missions offering, they were impacting people that they would never meet and changing the course of eternity for uncountable numbers, just like the people in your church do. I hope you'll be encouraged and inspired at this year's SBC Pastors Conference. I pray that across our convention, our churches will be more focused on their sending capacity than their seating capacity. We must take to heart the Lord's call to make disciples of all nations. May God bless your time together, and we're so grateful for your partnership. Good evening, I'm Mark Talbert. I'm the director of the Caskey Center for Church Excellence at New Orleans Baptist Seminary. And I wanna thank you so much for being here to be a part of our pastor's conference this year in Phoenix. This is a unique pastor's conference. For those of you that have attended in the past, you may recognize that our speakers come from average sized churches. The pastors that are, have spoken earlier tonight and will be speaking throughout this weekend, we have selected because they are God-called expositors of God's Word. And already you'll, you've seen that they will do a great job leading us through the book of Philippians. Every year we have sponsors that assist and make the pastor's conference a reality. You may not realize this, but the convention does not pay for this meeting. This is paid for by donated funds. And so this year, as every year, we have sponsors that have generously helped us. But this year is a bit different because we are mostly smaller membership churches. We needed, we needed a partner. And the Caskey Center at New Orleans Seminary agreed to be a major po uh, sponsor, partner rather, for this year's Pastors Conference. And, and let me just tell you how that happened. It's actually a, a perfect union because the focus of the Pastors Conference this year and the focus of the Caskey Center for Church Excellence is the same. And that is to encourage average size, smaller membership, really quite frankly, normal size Southern Baptist churches to be healthy, to make disciples and to reach people in their community for the Lord Jesus Christ. So each of the four sessions, we'll have a few moments to share with you the resources that are available to you, particularly if you serve in an average size or smaller membership Southern Baptist Church. We will have resources tomorrow to assist you in how you can engage people in everyday gospel conversations. We've developed a wonderful tool for your phone. It's an app as well as a pocket wallet that will go on your phone that will encourage you to reset every week to be focused on having gospel conversations. Sometimes we drift away from evangelism. It's not something we intend to do. It just seems to happen. 
And so we've developed a tool to help you reset every Monday morning on looking for someone with whom you can have that intentional gospel conversation. We're going to be having some book giveaways from Dr. Jimmy Draper, Dr. Rhonda Kelly, and Dr. Robbie Gallaty. They will be signing their books at the booth tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon, and so you'll want to be stopping by and getting those resources and having your books signed by the authors. And then for those of you that serve in a smaller membership church that have never had the opportunity to visit Israel, we are giving away a trip with our NOBTS faculty to Israel next January. So if you serve in a smaller membership church, that's less than 250 in worship, and you've never had the opportunity to visit Israel before, be sure and stop by our booth tonight or tomorrow and sign up for that trip. That will close at 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and tomorrow night we will be giving that trip away to one of you pastors. But let me take just a moment and introduce you to, the, to what the Caskey Center is. Most of you are learning about the Caskey Center for the very first time tonight, and I'm aware of that. Three years ago, the Caskey Center for Church Excellence was launched at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And we are named in honor of a pastor who chances are you've never heard of before. That's Brother Steve Caskey. Steve Caskey was a bivocational small church pastor in Louisiana. He served there in the 60s and the 70s. He's, uh, he's with the Lord today, uh, but really was never able to complete his formal education, served in smaller membership churches most of his life. Now fast forward 40 years, a very generous family in Louisiana knew Brother Steve, loved him, and came to us and said, we believe there are a lot of Steve Caskies out there, men that are serving, following God's will, answering God's call, and maybe would use some encouragement and some help. So they came to us and, and gave us a very generous gift. In fact, I will tell you that when they established the Caskey Center, we received at New Orleans Seminary the largest individual gift we have ever received. But here's the great part. It was only for those serving in smaller churches. We thought that was pretty cool. The biggest gift for the smallest churches. It's sort of fun as the director of the Caskey Center now, when I have folks come to me to see if we can help them, they don't brag about how big their church is, they brag about how small they are. So we have the opportunity to do a lot of things. We provide full tuition scholarships in selected states, we provide training, we provide resources as we've already mentioned. We basically want you to know tonight at the Pastors Conference that when the Pastors Conference this year is over, if you serve in a smaller membership church, you have someone to be your champion. You have someone to be here for you. And that's the Caskey Center for Church Excellence. The reason for that is we believe that all churches matter, regardless of the size. If God has called you to a particular ministry context and you're faithful to that, you're answering God's call there, you are serving in a significant church. I'm a professor at New Orleans Seminary. I teach preaching and pastoral ministry. A, a professor colleague of mine several years ago had a student come to him who was about to graduate from one of our schools and said, I'm excited about the ministry God has for me. Please pray for me. And my professor friend said, how shall I pray for you? He said, well, please pray that God will place me in a significant church. Well, that was the wrong thing to say to my professor friend. He said, young man, let me ask you a question. Are you suggesting that there are churches that are insignificant in the kingdom of God? Let me share with you three reasons why your church, the church that you serve, the church to which God has called you, regardless of its size, is significant in God's kingdom. First of all, it's significant in terms of our convention. When people think about Southern Baptists, many times they think about those large flagship mega churches with well-known celebrity pastors. That's not who we are. That's not who Southern Baptists are. Would it surprise you if I were to tell you that 85% of the churches in the Southern Baptist Convention average less than 250 in attendance every week? Over 70% average less than 100 every week. I want to suggest 70% is a big deal. It's a really big deal. 
The Chicago Cubs won the World Series last year. That broke my heart as a Braves fan. But the Cubs won the World Series after a long wait. They won. They had the best record in the major leagues. They won 64% of their games, better than any other team in MLB. 70% would have for sure won the World Series. 70% is a big deal. If you and I were to go out tonight and share a pizza and I ate 70% of it, you're going to be upset with me because that's most of it. 70% of the Southern Baptist Convention serves in smaller membership churches. And so if you are serving in a church that's not significantly large numerically, you should understand that you're in a significant church in terms of our convention. Your church is significant in terms of its context. God has placed you in a church in a particular place in a particular time for such a time as this. Have you ever thought about the fact that the, all of the churches that we read about in the New Testament, the churches to whom Paul wrote, church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church at Colossae, the churches that he visited on his missionary journeys in the book of Acts, the churches to whom John wrote in the book of Revelation, those seven churches. In fact, I visited those ancient sites. Of all of those churches, Scripture does not record the size of any of those churches. We don't know if Ephesus was bigger than Philippi or Laodicea was bigger than Pergamon. We know about some of their characteristics. We know about their faithfulness. We know about their struggles. Isn't it interesting that God did not seem to think it was significant to record for us the size of those churches? So when you're here this week for the pastor's conference or you're here for the convention, don't worry about telling folks the size of your church. Don't try to impress them. I've got a preacher friend in Arkansas, he pastors up in the Ozarks, he loves to go to meetings like this where nobody knows him because he knows if they meet pretty soon they're going to say, tell me how big your church is. And he's always got a ready answer. Now he's got a small church in the Ozarks, but when they ask that question, here's what he says. He says, we run between seven and eight hundred. And they'll say, really? And he'll say, yeah. And he'll walk off chuckling, yeah, we run between seven and eight hundred. <laughs> Amen. Some of you serve a church like that, don't you? <laughs> Scripture does not record the size of any of the churches in the New Testament. So I just want you to know your, your, your church is significant because of the context, the time and place in which God has called you to serve that church for such a time as this. And your church is significant in terms of your calling. I don't know about you. Someone asked me backstage just a few minutes ago, they said, Dr. Talbert, how long have you been preaching? 44 years. That's a lot of sermons. That makes me sleepy just to think about it. 44 sermon years of preaching. But may I say to you that it's probably like you, I didn't do this because this was my idea. This was God's idea. God's called me to do what I'm doing, and God's called you to do what you are doing. And here's what I would remind you of. The Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many noble. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world what is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing what is viewed as something and I love this so that no one can boast in the presence of God if I can just sort of contextualize that I might say not many mega churches not many multi-campus churches not many bulging budget churches now it doesn't say not any but it says not many, but instead God has called the bivocational. God has called the non-sensational. God has called the contemporary and the traditional. God has called the faithful. God has called the faithful that are faithfully serving in the context in which God has called them. So we want you to know we're here this weekend. The Caskey Center is very privileged to be a part of the team that is providing this conference this week. We hope it'll be a great encouragement to you. But we want you to know that when the pastor's conference is over and you go back home, please pick up material at our booth. We want to be your resource for church excellence. That's why the Caskey Center is here.
But this conference is not about big versus small or small versus big. We put on a conference each April. It's the uh, No Restraints Conference on our campus, and that's named uh, as a result of the scripture in 1 Samuel 14, 6. In that passage, Jonathan is going into battle, and he's greatly outnumbered by the enemy. Jonathan's going into battle with his armor bearer, and he makes this statement. He says, come, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. And then he says this, listen, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. So we have a no restraints conference. God's not restrained to save by the many, and sometimes there are large churches. They were not always large. I want to introduce a friend to you tonight that really needs no introduction. You already know it, my friend. We were going to be having a, a guest come in each one of our sessions to share a common ground testimony. And tonight we have Dr. Fred Luter. Dr. Luter is the pastor of the great Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. It's the largest Southern Baptist Church in the state of Louisiana. He's past president of the Southern Baptist Convention. His church is about 10 minutes from the campus of New Orleans Seminary. And he's been at Franklin Avenue since 1986. And so I've asked Brother Fred to come and share his common ground testimony story of how he got started there and what God taught him in a church that was a little bit smaller when he arrived. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Fred Luter to the platform? I'm so glad you're here. The Lord. How you doing, Doc? Well, good evening. How's everybody doing? It is just good to be in a place hotter than New Orleans. I tell you, I didn't think, I knew hell was hotter than New Orleans, but I didn't know that Phoenix is definitely hotter than New Orleans. It's just a joy and a privilege to be here. Giving obedience to God, my Father, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord and Savior of my life. President Miller, man, I'm so proud of you. Thank God for you. He and I, when I was president, hung out in Israel for about a week and a half. Good to see you. Dr. Talbot, thank you for this wonderful invitation. When Dr. Talbot called me to be a part of this, I was really excited because of how I got started at Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, many of you know our story, some of you may not. I went to Franklin Avenue in 1986. I was a street preacher. Didn't know anything about the Southern Baptist Convention. Didn't know anything about uh, 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 the, the, the great work that Southern Baptist, I, I was raised up National Baptist. And I was preaching in a National Baptist Church and somebody there heard me and asked me would I be interested in uh, submitting my resume to Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. And I didn't know anything about the church, but my wife and I were praying about going uh, where the direction that God wanted us to go. And so, Pastor Parker, I put in my resi uh, my resignation, my resume, and, uh, and as they say, the rest is history. I was as scared as can be. I never, ever pastored before in my life. I wasn't even ordained. I wasn't even, a, a, I wasn't even ordained. I had never been to the seminary yet. Uh, but yet, a congregation of 50 people people asked me to be their preacher, to be their pastor. And I was so excited about that opportunity because of the fact that here are folk that really did not know a lot about me but trusted in me enough to be their pastor. And a pastor from Atlanta, Georgia, and I was talking to him, a so older pastor, asking him some advice. He gave me this passage of Scripture that I want to give to you right now, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. It simply says this, His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. As a result of that passage of Scripture and talking to this pastor friend of mine, I was convinced that the way I was going to go, Brother Brent, into this new church, into this new opportunity that the God was given to me, is that I needed to be faithful to what God was calling me to do. And so I want to share with all the pastors that are here, particularly those of you who are just starting out, or those who are in smaller churches, uh, there's four, uh, four things uh, real quickly in the five and a half minutes that I have left in this testimony that God has done done in my life. I am convinced, brothers, I am convinced, ladies, I am convinced, pastors, that God rewards faithfulness. 
God rewards faithfulness. God rewards faithfulness. When I got to Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, 50 members uh, uh, on row, uh, uh, about 25 in attendance, but I went there and trusting and believing that if I was faithful in several areas, God would be faithful to us. So I want to share and encourage and in challenge and challenge every pastor here. I don't care what the size of the church, I don't care what the location in the urban centers, uh, uh, in the suburbs, uh, if you're faithful in these four areas, I have no doubt in my mind that God will bless your ministry. First of all, you need to be faithful to God. Be faithful to God. God is the one that call you. Mama didn't call you. Daddy didn't call you. I hope mama didn't call you. I hope daddy didn't call you. God called you into ministry. And because God called you into ministry, whatever you do in life as a preacher, as a pastor, make sure that you're faithful to God because God is the one that called you. He's the one that you got to give an account to as to what you're doing, how you, when you stand up into the, up in the pulpit, when you stand before the people, be faithful to the God that called you out of all the people in this world. God thought enough of you to call you and you and you into the ministry. So therefore, you need to be faithful to God. Second thing, real quickly, not only be faithful to God, secondly, be faithful to God's Word. Be faithful, guys, to God's Word. Uh, preach it, teach it, and live the Word of God. Let me say that again. Preach it, teach it, and live the Word of God, the Bible. If people are going to be saved, uh, it will be because of the Word of God. Uh, if people are going to be delivered, it's going to be because of the Word of God. If people are going to grow as disciples, it's going to be because of the Word of God. Uh, if your church is going to evangelize uh, and win the loss, uh, it's going to be because of the Word of God. When you stand in the pulpit, don't ask them to turn uh, to page 25 of, uh, of, of Reader's Digest or People Magazine or Time Magazine. No, if people are going to be delivered, and set free. They need to hear the Word of God. Uh, the, uh, uh, don't clap. I got, I got three more minutes. Uh, God, God, God told Ezekiel, Ezekiel, if these dry bones are going to live, uh, these dry bones must hear the Word of God. Guys, preach the Word of God. When Jesus was tempted by the devil after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and when he came off the mountaintop, when the enemy tried to get Jesus to fall, Jesus said, Satan, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Guys, preach the Word of God of God. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to God's Word. Number three, be faithful to your wife and your family. I need to say that one more time. Be faithful to your wife and your family. Brothers, pastors, your family is your first priority, not the church. The church is God's church. It's going to go on with you or without you, but you've got to give an account for your family. Be faithful to your wife and be faithful to your family family without you you got to have a a, 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 a a conviction of that that's nothing you need to apologize for that's nothing you need to explain to people let the members of your church know let the deacons know let the trustees know let the leadership know that my family is my first priority and there are going to be times when I can't make it to a trustee meeting I can't make it to a deacon meeting because my son has a soccer game my daughter has a dance recital and if I got to be at any place it's going to be supporting my son or supporting Supporting my daughter. This is on a, this is lanyard. Brothers, on your anniversary, don't take any preaching engagements. Don't take any assignments. You be that type and be there with your wife and be there. I promise you, it's going to make all the difference in the world. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to you. I love the way Joshua said. When Joshua's friends were getting off God and they were involved in other things, Joshua looked at his partners and friends and said, Guys, y'all do what y'all want to do. Go where y'all want to go. But man, as for me and my family, as for me and Sister Joshua, as for me and Joshua Jr., as for me and Joshua Red, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Guys, make your families a priority. And then lastly, in the 50 seconds that I have left, guys, be faithful to God, be faithful to God's Word, be faithful to your family, and lastly, be faithful to the church that called you. Be faithful to the church that called you. When I went to Franklin Avenue Baptist Church and back in 1986, these people didn't even know how to pronounce my name. My name is Luda. They were calling me Lucifer, Luda, Luther, everything. 
but I wanted to be faithful to this church because they gave me a chance. They looked at me and said, we want you to pastor our church. So don't go to the church where you call with a resume in your back pocket saying, I'm only going to be here just for a little while, and then I'll move on to bigger and better things. Uh, you bloom where you're planted. Ask God to do a great work where you are, and I promise you, God will bless you. I had no idea when I went to Franklin Avenue Baptist Church in 1986 that one day we would be leading our state in baptism and leading our state in Sunday school attendance, and now we're leading uh, uh, the largest Southern Baptist church uh, in the state of Louisiana. And believe it or not, at one time, two years in 2012, this small church preacher that started in, in 2012 was elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention. God is a God of faithful. So God, guys, as I go to my seat, the music going to begin to play. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to God's Word. Be faithful to God's, uh, to your family, and be faithful to your church. And I'm a living witness. I'm a living testimony, Dr. Talbot. If you're faithful to God, I'm a witness that God will be faithful to you. God bless you. God keep y'all. Hang, hang in there. Keep the faith. God will bless you if you're faithful to God. Love y'all. Love y'all. Good to see you, man. Let's stand. The snow is rolled away. 